<laughs> oh dear. Hello, welcome to Peer Vignettes episode 10, I think. Um, you can see over there, since the last time I recorded, I got a kitten. He's really cute and he's going crazy the last couple of days. I think he's going through a growth spurt or something because he's just like, every movement is a pounce or a run or something. Something crazy, something that involves biting my hands. I have kitten bites all over my hands uh, and little kitten scratches all over my thighs from whenever he tries to jump on my lap while I'm working at the computer. <laughs> um, but he's fitting in great. He's getting along well with the dogs. He's starting to get along well with the cat. Um, so that's exciting. And I'll just let him play around in the background there. <laughs> uh, it is Sunday morning, May 31st. My name is Liz, and this is my podcast about knitting, spinning, crocheting, and natural dyeing. Um, and I am coming to you from my home outside of Taos, New Mexico, in the southwestern United States. You can find me on Ravelry as Bomberdu, put down here, and on Instagram as Pyramid Dye Works, also will put down here. And I'm excited to announce you can also now find me on Etsy as Pyramid Dye Works, which I will also put down here and I will link in the uh, notes below. Um, so that's pretty exciting. That is a new thing. Um, I had been selling my yarns at the local yarn shop here in Taos, Vortex Yarns. Um, but sadly, with all of the COVID shutdowns and everything, um, she just didn't see a viable way to stay open and not go into intense amounts of debt. Uh, so she decided to just close the shop and start selling online. Um, so I am also going to start selling online. Yay! <laughs> um, so I will get uh, a little bit later into everything that I've got in the shop right now. Um, first, I'll, you know, do the standard thing, go through my finished objects, works in progress, spinning, and then I'll get to natural dyeing. Um, and at the end, I will put in a little compilation of my uh, May garden recap. It's looking really good out in my garden. I have started eating from the garden this week, finally. <laughs> um, I felt like I've been waiting to do that for a long time. Um, I've got spinach coming out my ears, uh, so I can eat spinach just about every day. Um, I did a broccoli stir fry the other night with my broccoli rob I've got growing, and I've got some strawberries that are ripening and peas are starting to come in. Um, so that's really nice to not have to go to the store as often. <laughs> um, also on this Sunday morning, you might be joining me with a coffee. I'm joining you with a Bloody Mary. It's my favorite breakfast cocktail. <laughs> um, I had picked up since we're, you know, all trying to support our local businesses, I'm going to give a shameless plug to one of my local businesses. I picked up some of this Bloody Maria mix, uh, which is a whoop, michelada and bloody mix. Um, it's really good. They make it here in Taos. And I saw that they're selling it on Amazon now. So I figured if anybody out there wants to get some nice um, local Bloody Mary mix made with New Mexico green chili... Um, you can pick that up online now, which is pretty cool. That's what we're all doing these days. Um, but I had picked this up uh, last week because I had some green chili beer. Um, and I wanted to make micheladas out of it. Which I don't know if you guys have ever had a michelada. Um, it's beer and bloody mix, basically. <laughs> like a light lager or something. Uh, so it was a lager with green chilies in it. And you add a couple of ounces of the bloody mix into it and... It just makes it a tasty, spicy beverage. Um, and I had a little bit left, and I've been saving it <laughs> for this Sunday um, so I could drink it while I was doing my podcast. Um, and I picked up some Tito's vodka out of Austin, um, also my preferred vodka, um, also my hometown. So I got to give them a plug, too. <laughs> and I added a little extra pickle juice to mine because that's my way. Um, and a little squirt of fresh lime. And it is delish. So, yeah, 
Um, last time I talked to y'all, my knitting mojo was pretty low. Um, because it turns out that um, quarantine, living alone, is real good to bring up some latent depression issues. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I've been um, going through a nice little phase of that lately, uh, which has not been good for my housekeeping. I can say that. <laughs> There's some parts of my house that I'm, I'm just trying not to look at. It's like, that's really gross. <laughs> um, I'm, you know, I'm working on it. I'm working with my therapist. I'm going to be fine. Uh, but it it sucks. It really sucks. And I think there's a lot of people out there who are going through the same thing right now. Um, and just not having the same connections they used to have and not being able to connect with people. And, um, it really is bringing up a lot of stuff. And, uh, that's no fun. Um, but I'm glad to say my knitting mojo is back, uh, because I got a spinning wheel. I had mentioned that last time that I was going to get a spinning wheel. I got it and I fell in love with it immediately. And as soon as I started spinning, I was like, oh my God, I want to knit all the things too. <laughs> so I've been on a good crafting kick the last uh, month too. Um, so I have a lot of stuff to show you. And I'm really glad I'm back in that kick because it feels better to be stressed out about the state of the world knitting than to be stressed out about the state of the world on the couch under a blanket. There's a difference. <laughs> um, and yeah, the state of the world, my God. Um, I mean, what do you even say? I feel like this COVID period of worldwide quarantine, essentially, um, is really like a mass forced meditation, which is bringing up a lot of issues for people, hence a little depression flare up. Um, it's also really adeptly pointing out all of the shortcomings in our healthcare systems, um, in our inequalities with access to healthcare, um, what it does to a person's life and life expectancy to not be born into upper middle class, basically. Um, and also to be born with a different color skin. Uh, and I think, I think all of this chaos is bringing up a lot of truths about our society that a lot of people maybe weren't aware of, a lot of people were able to ignore before, but now that all of us are out of our habits, we're out of our complacency, we're out of our routines, um, and so many of us have experienced so much grief in the last few months. There's so many people who have recently lost someone, and I think that's probably contributing to some extra empathy towards seeing somebody die in front of our eyes. I would hope that it does. Um, people are closer to the emotions. Uh, it, we can't hide in our routines right now. Everything is much more real. And I hope, I believe that we are in a perfect storm for change. And I don't know which way that change is going to go right now. <laughs> I certainly hope it goes in the way of more compassion and more equality and a better society for all of us to live in with better social safety nets and I mean, we just, we have to look out for each other. It can't be this ladder where if you make it up, you knock everybody else down. It's just, that's not sustainable. 
that's not sustainable and something has to change and something will change. Um, I fear and I suspect that things will get much worse before they start to get better. Um, but truth is uncomfortable and anytime someone's been spoken truth to that maybe you didn't really want to hear, you didn't want to hear the truth, it hurts. You're angry, you react, which is what's happening right now on a mass level. And that's totally understandable. But after a period, I hope that that can be converted into action and growth and something more positive. So I hope that you are all safe, you are all keeping well, you are all keeping sane. And that things will get better. I just don't know when. So, yeah. Uh. <laughs> anyway, chew up my eyes. Let's get into the knitting. So, finished objects. I have two, I think. <laughs> Let's see, I've got a big pile of things back here. Um, okay, first finished object is, oh, or maybe first, I should talk about what I'm wearing, which it's kind of dark right now in my house. We had a big uh, rainstorm yesterday afternoon and into last night, and it's still pretty overcast and cloudy, so it's not super bright in here, and this is kind of a dark sweater. Uh, but I am wearing my White Horse, which is a pattern by Caitlin Hunter, and I knit it in um, Elizabeth's, Elizabeth Lavold's Silky Wool in the colorway Aubergine. Um, and it's a wool silk blend. I'll stand up. Oh, okay. You can see it better in the light here. And it's got this lovely um, lace yoke that goes down really deep. It fits nice and loose. It's got kind of half sleeves. It's got quite a wide neckline. That's the only thing I don't really like about it is that it kind of falls out past my straps, you know, and I have to wear a tank top underneath it. Um, so I do find that I like pull it in a lot whenever I wear it. Um, but it's so comfortable and it's like perfect for a morning like this where it's a little overcast and it's a little cool. Um, turn around and show you the back. I'm really happy with this knit though. Um, I finished it last fall and I do need to do a little repair on it because it's got these little bobbles all over it. You might have seen whenever I stood up. Can you see bobbles? There's a bobble. A little bobble sticking up. Um, anyway, uh, my dog ate one of the bobbles. <laughs> he found a little nubbin and just started nibbling on it and he just chewed off a bobble. Um, so there's not a hole in it. Oh, I can see where it, it is right here. Can you see there's like this little stray thread <laughs> poking up. Um, and this is a really sticky wool. It sticks to itself really well. So it's not unraveling or anything. I just need to. So I did. I found the bobble on the floor. Here it is. <laughs> so I suppose I could actually just tie it back on there and knot it on the back. Um, so maybe I'll do that. But yeah, he just couldn't resist the little nubbin. It was not this dog. It was the other dog. So don't be mad at him. Um, he's done different bad things, but he didn't do this bad thing. <laughs> Uh, yes, yeah, so that's what I'm wearing. So now we can move on to finished objects. I finished my litmus cowl. Yay! Um, this thing is freaking wonderful. I mean, look at it. This blue grating is fantastic. Oh, excuse me. And it wraps around my neck twice. And it's this lovely blue gradient. Uh, this is a pattern by Amy Florence, um, and I did this in, the white is Fiberco Acadia, which is a wool silk, and I think it has some alpaca in it too, and that's actually a DK weight yarn. And then this blue gradient I bought at Taos Wool Fest last fall, and that is from the 100th Sheep up in Colorado, um, and they had these great little mini gradient sets, and I just couldn't resist. <laughs> um, and that is fingering weight. 
So I, whenever I started it, I weighed everything out the, on the first stripe that I did and calculated all of my math of like how much I could knit for each stripe and use up all of my yarn. So I did that. Sorry, my cat, my other cat, he's right here. That's his tail. He's meowing behind my camera. <laughs> um, oh, and he's trying to make a nest on my work in progress sweater. Like, Just don't snag it, buddy. Um, anyway, yeah, so I measured it all out and figured out, um, I could do 16 stripes in the fingering weight and eight stripes in the DK weight, which makes total sense, right? Um, this is Tim, tiny Tim. He's my 17 year old cat. He's been with me for 17 years. <laughs> Uh, so he may be joining me in my lap right now. That's fine. Um, yeah, so I was going along, knitting very happily, and then I ran out of white yarn. Thanks, Tim. Um, <laughs> I ran out of white yarn, like, almost at the end. And I said in the last episode that I had bought this at my local yarn shop, which then was closed. Uh, thankfully, I also, I sold my stuff there, and I also worked there part-time. I would fill in. Um so I just sent the owner an email and she was like, oh yeah, I still have some. <laughs> so I got another ball from her. Um, oh, that's not it. Where did it go? Where did that one go? There it is. Too many things. So I have this much left of it. It comes in 50 gram balls or 50 gram skeins and I have 36 grams left. Ah, and I hate having leftovers. I just didn't want to have leftovers. Um, so I don't know what I'm going to do with this. I could put it in my scrappy granny stripe blanket, but it's so nice. I kind of like, it's such a nice yarn. Um, I kind of want to save it for something else. So I think maybe I'll do like a color work hat at some point. Um, and I could use this as a contrast color, like a DK weight hat, a uh, neutral contrast, which I think would be pretty. So I might, uh, you know, stash it away until, that day comes. <laughs> uh, yeah, so other things, I knit this on a size US 4 needle, circular, 16 inch circular. Um, and I don't know if any of you guys out there have this, but I have a preference to knitting fingering white yarn on size 4 needles. <laughs> like that's kind of my favorite, that's my comfort zone. I don't know. It just feels the most natural to my hands. Like that's the one, that's the, like the size uh, combination that just, I can just go and go and go and I don't have to look at my hands. And yeah, so this was great. <laughs> this was great. <laughs> um, lots of stockinette in the round. And I can't wait until fall when I can actually wear this thing now. <laughs> I was hoping to have finished it the spring, so I could have worn it this spring, but we had a really warm spring, so I don't know that I would have worn this anyway. And also, we didn't leave the house this spring, so <laughs> I probably wouldn't have worn it. Mm, yum. Okay, <laughs> next finished object. I didn't even show this to you guys last time. I cast it on spur of the moment. It's a crochet project. Can you believe it? I'm learning how to crochet. I made myself a little market bag. Isn't it so cute? And the irony is I'm wearing a purple sweater and I have a purple market bag. I don't really like the color purple. Not sure how that happened. <laughs> um, I mean, I just couldn't resist this dark purple in the silky wool. Like it just, it wanted to be made into the sweater. Um, yeah, like I saw the yarn and I was like, I have to make a white horse out of that. So I did. Um, and this was stash yarn, deep stash yarn. Um, it is, there's hairs all over it. Um, sorry, I have a cat jumping into my lap. Oh, goodness, so many animals. I have two cats and two dogs. And you can see two of them right now. <laughs> um, I had bought this yarn uh, for a baby project for my cousin many years ago. Um, I think her daughter's like four now. Uh, and 
she is went to TCU in Texas and their colors are purple, purple and white. So I wanted to get knit her daughter something in purple. Um, so I got this yarn and I was gonna, I don't remember if I was gonna do, I think I was gonna try and do like a little baby dress out of it or something. Um, and she lives in Texas. So this is cotton and hemp. And you can see it's a marled yarn. So there's two strands of cotton and one strand of hemp. And I'll show you the yarn here in just a second. Um, but it just, it was too thick and it was like working up too big and I ended up doing something completely different. So I had a ton of this <laughs> purple cotton and hip yarn um, and I had an urge to make a market bag. Um, I think because our farmer's market was opening and I was like, oh, wouldn't that be so cute to have a little market bag? <laughs> I'm joking. Uh, so I just cast it on impulsively and it's not done great because this is my first like cro real crochet project like I'm making a granny stripe blanket but this is the first time I've ever tried to make like something three-dimensional um, so I had to start it over like four times because I was following this pattern that had you like start in a different way um, with like a really long edge and like I just wasn't getting it and I kept going into the wrong spaces and I just didn't understand what I was doing because I've never done like tried to follow a crochet pattern before you know uh, so then I did a little Google on the YouTubes and found a video on how to make a market bag and I just followed the video <laughs> um, and it was it made it a lot easier because it had you start with this uh, top section so then you had like something solid to work off of. The other pattern would like had you start in the mesh and it was just like, it was not working with my brain. Um, so yeah, and then you can see like the edging is not good. So on the straps here, you work around and then you chain stitches around and you work off of them. So my chain is a mess. It's just an absolute mess. Like you can see the cast off edge is nice and clean and tight, but the chain on edge is just a disaster. <laughs> uh, because I'm not used to it. And yeah, I mean, it's my first proper crochet project. So that's part of the course, you know? Um, yeah, so both sides are like that, whatever. Uh, so it's a cute little bag. And I can't wait to take it to the farmer's market with me. <laughs> um, I've always wanted to be somebody who shops at the farmer's market. And I've never been able to do it regularly because, I don't know, I don't want to get up and go into town first thing on Saturday morning, mostly. But now, uh, the farmer's market seems a lot better than going to the grocery store. <laughs> So I'm trying to make an effort to go every week and, you know, get my produce there and, you know, they've got eggs and they've got local meat and um, I have impulse bought two fruit trees so far this year at the farmer's market. I bought myself an apricot tree and a, and a plum tree uh, to plant outside. I haven't put them in the ground yet. But, um, so you can find all sorts of goodies there. <laughs> uh, so those are my two finished objects. So, <laughs> works in progress. First work in progress, I showed this to you guys last time. It's a sweater. And last time I had two sleeves and some of the bottom ribbing. And today I am happy to show you, it's almost like a whole thing. Yay! I attached the sleeves last night, so I'm on the very, very long rows before the yoke starts and you start doing decreases. Uh, but I'm super happy with this. This is the After Party Sweater. It's by, I can tell you because I have the book right here, Astrid somebody, Astrid Trolland. And it is out of Lane Magazine, issue six. Um, 
I'll show you a picture of the finished sweater there. It's a really nice yoked sweater, loose fitting. There's some more pictures there. So <clears throat> I am knitting this out of my own yarn. So this is my own hand dyed yarn. Um, I dyed the main color in avocado and I dyed the contrasting color in cochineal. Um, this was an old test skein, uh, so I don't really remember what I did with it, but I'm pretty sure I dyed it first with bindweed, um, which I have a ton of in my yard, which is a weed, and it binds to other plants and kills them. Um, so I'm more than happy to pull it up out of the ground. <laughs> um, and it, it is a natural dye as well. It makes kind of like this bland, beigey, goldish color, um, like beige heading into yellow, but it's not all that pretty on its own. But you put it underneath some cochineal and you get a nice little maroon. There you go. Um, so yeah, here we go. Um, so the main color base is my half pint base. I don't have any of that up in my shop right now just because I haven't taken pictures and uploaded it yet. Um, but it's a really nice yarn for color work. It's a two ply fingering. It's 100% uh, Peruvian Highland wool. Um, it's nice and grippy, which is why it's good for um, color work. And I have made sweaters out of this before. Um, it does pill a little bit, but it's it holds up really well. And it feels, it feels really nice uh, for being like a woolly wool. Um, it doesn't bother me like up against my arms or anything like that. So what else can I say about this? Um, I talked last week about how I didn't measure, I didn't do a gauge swatch. I'm not going to go into that. I had to re-knit the sleeve like three times. So do a gauge swatch people. And then I figured out that, because I measured my gauge finally, I figured out that I had to actually cast on a size 3XL to equal a size large. So that's what I've done. I'm knitting the 3XL size, but it's going to be a size large, basically. And that means there's a lot of stitches. <laughs> there's a lot of stitches on here right now. Um, it's like 450 stitches on the needle right now or something around there. Uh, I've got a few more rows, you know, maybe like another inch or so. You can see how far in I am from the sleeve connection. I think I've got about another inch before I start doing the yoke color work. It's a pretty deep yoke, which means it's a pretty deep armholes. It's similar actually to the way this sweater fits. Um, so yeah, I just got to keep on trekking on that. And once I hit the color work, I think that's going to go really fast because working through all of the stock in it <laughs> uh, was a little bit of a slog. I definitely had to set it down for a week or two and then come back to it. Uh, but I'm almost at the color work now, so that's pretty motivating. Yeah, so what else can I say about this? Um, yeah, I had to modify the sleeves a lot because I talked about that in my last episode. It, my, I have a big discrepancy between my shoulder and my wrist, so I usually have to do more increases or decreases depending on which way you're going. Um, it's also figuring weight, and I'm knitting it on a size 4 needle, so I'm really enjoying that. <laughs> so, my other whips. It's my granny stripe blanket. Um, and I didn't work on this very much this time around. And I don't know that I'm going to work on it very much the next few times around. Um, so I put in this little stitch marker progress keeper to show where I was the last time I recorded. So I've only done like just a few rows. But I did use some of my hand dyed yarn, which is lovely. So this one right here was dyed with matter root. And I call that color painted desert. Um, I don't have any of that color in my shop right now, but I am planning to dye some up soon. And then this top color is also a natural dye, and that is from the Chamisa flowers in my yard uh, from, I don't know, last summer, the summer before that, or something like that. 
Uh, so those were just some test gains that I had lying around that I figured I would put in my blanket. Um, so the reason I'm probably not going to work on this very much in the next couple of months, one, it's summer and you don't want to be working on a blanket that's going to cover your lap. And two, I've decided to do Stash Dash. Um, Stash Dash is hosted by the Knit Girls. Uh, that's some Knit Girls with three L's. You can find their group on Ravelry. They've got everything in there. Um, but it's basically like a three-month challenge to knit through or spin through or crochet through, just work through as much yardage as you can. <laughs> um, so I've decided to be ambitious and I am going for 10, a 10K dash. Uh, so that is 10,000 meters of fiber that I need to work through. Uh, so far, I'm at 1,600. So I think I'm doing pretty good, but I don't know. I'm starting to get a little worried that I might not make it. <laughs> um, but anyway, you have to finish the thing for the yardage to count. And I'm not going to finish this in the next two months. Uh, or next three months even. So it might just kind of go to sleep until the fall and then I'll pick it up when it starts to get cold outside and work furiously. Um, but like, if it's not going to count towards dash dash, then why am I working on it right now? Right? Like I got to try and get my 10 K. <laughs> um, so things that did count for stash dash so far uh, was the litmus cowl and my crochet bag. Uh, and I've got some spinning. I'll show you to you that also counts, which is really exciting. Uh, but my other whip, my other whip. <laughs> Socks. I finished my first sock. I talked about this last time. Um, the yarn is from the Woolly Lizard in Cortez, Colorado. And I am loving this colorway. This is pooling. This is not stripes. It's just a spiral going up the sock. There are no stripes in the sock. Um, it's just pooling really consistently and finely, which I, I love it. I love it. Uh, so I finished the first sock. And I have, this is my little homemade project bag. It's the only project bag I own. <laughs> um, I've got my second sock started in here. I just turned the heel the other day, so I'm starting up the leg of the sock now. So it shouldn't be too much longer, like a couple more conference calls <laughs> and I should be done with it. Um, yeah, I don't know what else to say about this. It's my standard vanilla sock recipe. I knit on size US1 needles, 64 stitches around. I always do toe up. I do Judy's Magic Cast On for the toe. And then I do knit front to back increases uh, to increase along the toe because it's it's easier for me to do the knit front to back than it is to do make one right and make one left. Like it's just, it's less fiddly. Um, and then it also makes, if you can see, these little horizontal lines along the side. That's the thing that the knit front to back does is it puts in a little pearl bump um, along the increase. And I actually really like the way it looks on a sock toe. I think it's a nice little embellishment along the edge and it's easier for me to do. So that's just always what I do. Um, and I always do a German short row heel. Same thing because it's less fiddly and I don't really have to think about it. Um, and it fits my feet fine. It comes out looking nice. There we go. There's my heel. Uh, yeah, so plain vanilla socks on their way to having another pair of socks in my sock drawer. Um, and that's all my whips. That's all my whips. That's all my whips that I worked on <laughs> in the last month. All right, so spinning. I'm going to show you. Okay, I got my first wheel. <laughs> Let's take it back a step. I got my first wheel. I had a drop spindle before that I had for a few years, and I would work on it every once in a while, but I wasn't ever real consistent about it, and I didn't get very good at it. And um, it was just so slow, I couldn't get into it, you know? It's like I'm never gonna make anything in enough quantity that I can do anything with it on this thing, you know? Like it's a fun thing to do. 
um, but it just didn't seem very practical to me. So I finally had enough of an urge to learn how to spin that I got this spinning wheel. So I'll show you all of the yarns that I've spun on the spinning wheel so far. I got an Ashford Kiwi 3, which is a double treadle, uh, single drive. And I love it so far. Like it's easy to use. Um, it's compact. Uh, yeah. I mean, I don't have an experience with anything else, but um, I'm really enjoying it. It seems like a good beginner wheel. It was recommended to me by a few different people, um, and I like it so far. Uh, so the first yarn I spun on my wheel is this, which this was the practice yarn that came with the wheel. And you can see, you know, it's not too even. There's some big bumpy bits and some little fine bits, but it's still really pretty and it, it it's nice and um, it's even. I have soaked this, so, I mean, but you can see, like, it's not bad. For a first try, like, that's not bad. I was pretty impressed with myself. Um, so, uh, that's number one. Number two, I decided to just go for it <laughs> um, and I tried to do a Navajo ply, chain ply, which is a three ply. Um, and it's way too tight. I had a lot of trouble um, not getting things tangled up when I was doing the plying. So I had a lot of pulling things back out and trying to untangle things and then starting up again. and. I was still having issues with starting the wheel going in the wrong direction at that point. So I would do that and then stuff would get tangled up and it was kind of a nightmare. <laughs> uh, but still, like, I mean, it's way overspun and stuff, but I mean, for like my second yarn on a wheel ever that I just went ahead and did a Navajo ply, like, that's not bad. That can do bad. Um, I can do better, <laughs> I'm sure. <laughs> but again, this was practice fleece, like not concerned about it. Um, you know, I didn't imagine that I was going to do anything with my first spins anyway. And then my next practice game, I did another two ply. Um, and I just, I wanted to try and do it better. And there's still, <laughs> it is better, but there's still some weird... <laughs> Weird little bits that just like spun up on themselves and whatever. Um, again, wasn't intending to use this for anything, but it's a lot better than my first two ply, you can see. So I'll compare my first two ply and the second. It's like much more even. There's not as many big lumpies. There's not as many tiny little fine bits. It's much more consistent. It's still not super consistent, but it's much better than this one. Um, and I actually measured this one out. It's 324 yards and 84 grams. There we go. And then I went to my real fleece that I had bought a long time ago uh, when I got the drop spindle. And I got some Masham top, which I think the reason I did was because it was described as a long staple yarn or a long staple fleece that was easy to spin for beginner spinners. Um, and it was. <laughs> because look at this. Holy moly, people. Like, that's a proper yarn. That is a proper yarn. And there's two of them. I like don't even believe myself. Um, so I got 468 yards on this one and 585 yards on this one. <laughs> it's crazy. So yeah, I mean, that's a fingering weight yarn. Yeah, and I, I haven't soaked it yet, um, but even so, Do. 
Like it's really quite even. I'm, I'm flabbergasted. I can't believe I made this. Like I want to knit something from it now. Uh, and it's two ply. Um, yeah, the mashing was really easy to spin with. Uh, I don't know what else to say about it. I spun this on the middle ratio. I'm still not sure like which ratios are which <laughs> on my wheel, but it was on the, the middle one. Um, these I had done, all of these I did on the uh, largest one, the lowest speed. Um, and then this I did on the middle speed. And I've just started a new one, a new spin using Blue Face Lester um, on the highest speed to see what that does. So that one's just started, um, but I'm enjoying that too. So this counted for Stash Dash, which really helped. <laughs> uh, yeah, so that's my spinning. I don't know what I'm going to knit out of that. It's a decent bit of yardage, but yeah, I'll have to, I'll have to think about that. Um, and I'll probably dye it. <laughs> like I have to, right? Yeah, I have to. So natural dyeing. Um, I talked about it at the top of the podcast that I have opened up my Etsy shop, which is Pyramid Dye Works. Um, I don't have a ton of stuff in there right now, but it's a good little selection. Uh, it's basically what I had been dyeing up to sell in my little, lo sell in my local yarn shop. Um, Unfortunately, I have not been able to dye anything the last week or two uh, because the noceums are here. I don't know if anybody's ever dealt with noceums before, but they're this awful little bug that you can't see, hence the name. Um, but they bite you and it itches like crazy and it welts up. <laughs> I've got one coming in right there. <laughs> no. um, and I've got bites all over my arms. They like bit on my ears. They bit in my ears. They bit behind my ears, back of my neck. Like, oh, there. <laughs> Just talking about it is making me itchy. Um, they come out here uh, for about two, three weeks, around the end of May, early June. And it really makes being outside kind of impossible. Um, I sat on my porch. I did, I went for a hike yesterday. My dad and I, we drove up the mountain and went for a hike and the, the noceums are not up on the mountain. Um, so we, we were fine from them up there. Uh, but whenever I got home, I sat on my porch for like five minutes tops, tops before I was like, okay, I think I'm getting big. I got to go inside. And sure enough, this morning I woke up and I've got like all these new bites on my arms. <laughs> I don't know. Um, so my dye studio is my back porch. I dye outside. Uh, so I have not dyed anything in the last two weeks. Um, so God willing, these bugs are on their last, their last week. <laughs> I'll be able to get back out there. Um, so this is what I have in the store right now. Um, let's see. I just have a giant bag of things. So I'm just going to start like diving in and picking stuff at random, I think. Uh, okay. All right, I have Berry Patch on my sock yarn base. And this is dyed with Cochineal and Saxon Blue. Also on my sock base, I have Ocean Rider, which is dyed with Saxon Blue. You can hear my cat screaming in the background, probably. I have Butterscotch on my Aaron Tweed base. And this is a wool alpaca blend. And this is dyed with onion skins and coffee. I have light butterscotch, also dyed with onions, onion skins and coffee, um, on the Aaron Tweed base, as well as my Rancho space, which is a single ply worsted, 100% merino wool. Very soft. 
Also in Sock, I have Iris. And that is dyed with uh, Saxon Blue and Cochineal as well. On my Aaron Tweed base, I have Calypso, dyed with Saxon Blue. Also on Sock, I have Pink Moon, dyed in Avocado. On the Aaron Tweed base, I have Pearl, also dyed in Avocado. And this is one of those colors that like, it changes with the light. Like it's just, it's so subtle and so pretty the way natural dyes do. It's hard to pick up on the camera. Um, but it's just this lovely blush pink. I have antique bed frame on my sock base and also on my Aaron Tweed base. And this was dyed with Cote de Flower um, that I harvested, I foraged, excuse me, uh, that I foraged out by Abiquiu. And then I have a couple uh, discount yarns that are bases that I don't use anymore. Um, so I've got this one of a kind on a DK non superwash that is dyed in cochineal. And these are 25% off in my shop. And I also have this one of a kind avocado dyed. Uh, on a wool silk base. That is also 25% off in the shop because I don't have the space anymore. So that is everything that I have up there right now. Um, I do have some of my half pint base, this one that uh, I am knitting my after party out of. Um, I just need to photograph it and get it up there. So hopefully I'll get that up in the next week or so. Um, and then hopefully I can get back up in my dye studio soon. <laughs> Um, but I hope you guys, uh, enjoy what I have up there. Um, much more to come, many more colors, many more experimentations. Um, you know, I'm still just starting out. So if there's a color that you're interested in, uh, let me know. So I think that's everything I have for today that is fiber related. Um, I will end this, uh, podcast with a little, video tour of my garden and then just some random cute kitten footage <laughs> of uh, kitty being cute and playing with some of my knitting and lounging about the house. Uh, and I hope, oh, I hope that you all are staying afloat and staying safe and advocating for humanity and compassion and empathy with yourself and with those people that you're close to, because that is where change starts. And then hopefully one day we can all be as happy and relaxed as this little guy back here, right? Everything we need to know we learn from our dogs, right? <laughs> um, so I will go ahead and say goodbye uh, for this month. Cheers. And I will see you guys in a few weeks. Bye. So here I am heading out into my garden and there are the dogs. And walking up to my garden in front of the house, you can see it's much greener than last time. And looking at it from the other side, you can really see everything that's coming in there. That little blank spot towards the front has these lettuces in it that I planted. And within two minutes, I turned my back, I went inside the house, and uh, one of my dogs had dug them up. <laughs> I replanted them as quickly as I could, but they're not doing very well. And uh, those are volunteer sunflowers. I'm going to have to uh, cull some of those because there's just too many. And I've got, that's my first pea. 
first pea of the season and some of my spinach I've been eating off that and chard coming in next to it and more spinach with peas coming up in it and there's some little chard coming up and some kale and there's my best looking kale um, I'll be ready to harvest off of that pretty soon and my broccoli grob which I ate from this week uh, you can see I cut the center stem already right in there um, and I cut some of the side shoots and some of the leaves too and I sauteed those up with everything and another row of peas coming up and grabbing onto their little trellis net there's my strawberry that survived the winter is already putting out some strawberries I've got a little bushel there if you can call that a bushel that's just about right and it of course is surrounded by spinach <laughs> and next to it is some red leaf lettuce which those were starts I grew and put out and they're doing okay they're getting a little battered by the weather um, but that is another little row of lettuces that's coming up in between which is meant as a succession planting so by the time I eat the red leaf lettuce that lettuce seed coming up in the middle will be big enough to take over and here's my new garden beds uh, last time the one on the left was just a hole and now it's done and I have another hole on the right <laughs> So I have dug down about a foot. I'm going to fill that up with all the organic matter I can find, tree limbs, leaves, anything. And then I'll fill it back up with dirt and top it with compost, which is what I did with the bed on the left, which now has plants in it and things coming up. So that is a sunflower that I planted. You can see it's much taller than the volunteer sunflowers. That came up naturally and a marigold there and my first tomato that's planted out uh, you can see everything's still really dirty from the rain we had last night and that's a calendula and we've got radish seeds coming up a little row there <clears throat> And then in the back is some cilantro seeds that have started sprouting and another sunflower that I planted. And there is a hollyhock there uh, that I planted out and a mullein that is a uh, volunteer just coming up in the yard. And I'm putting out bird seed for the birds. <laughs> 